And that was the beginning of a transformation whereby in three and a half years, we became twice as wealthy than we'd ever been before. I never went back to the office. In fact, we moved from California to Texas and built this incredible machine that was very economical, but very well producing, get out of debt. I have no debt anywhere in the world. You know, we own properties and other businesses, no debt anywhere. Never went to the office, like I said, and ended up having the greatest marriage and the greatest father. And my three kids are incredible, 26, 23, 21. And it changed everything for me. And I realized that I was doing everything backwards. You know, th there are these two trajectories of life. There's fluid intelligence, crystallized intelligence. And the fluid intelligence is sort of the young, you know, uh, effervescent, ideological, innovative thinking, right? Those are the guys in you know, what used to be Silicon Valley, but now that's dead. And they're the, you know, the idea generators. That lasts about 10, 20 years, give or take, depending on the industry. Crystallized intelligence is for the wise individuals who are not as innovative and creative, but have wisdom. And that is really significantly more powerful than the innovation if you can marry the two. All branding is personal. And it's not about who you say you are. It's about who you are and how you say it. I'm Hirsch Rethman, copywriter, comedian, and brand voice expert. I've helped hundreds of companies fine tune their messaging. And now I'm sitting down with some of the most ambitious and imaginative founders around who share their seven figure stories and their next figure goals. Let's hit the brand voice runway. It is possible to be known to some, to be unknown to others, to do a lot of podcasts and still somehow not be a household name, but to move very fluidly in the circles of notoriety and power and wealth, especially when you're integral to getting those people to where they want to go. And my guest today is Marx Acosta Rubio. I will tell you three things about Marx. There's a lot to talk about, but we we talk about personal brand and his personal brand is in line with the fact that he was a millionaire by the age of 31, a decamillionaire by the age of 33, and then just broke ass at 38. And we will go through a lot of these different stages and also get a sense of what he is really all about. Marks, welcome to Brand Voice Runway. Thanks for having me, Hirsch. I appreciate it. And please, let's not leave it. I broke at 38 because I did become rich again. Yes. So it's not right. It's like, yeah. And then he just messed up. And so, no, 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 no. He's there was a resurgence. He's still and broke. No. Yes. I And I was thinking that as I said it, but in any event, yes. So he I have he a broke did, ass guest today and that's the end of it. So that's no. right. That's right. There wouldn't be much. <laughs> there wouldn't be like a tremendous place to go from there. We would just say, yeah, that sucks. But and that but, was a show, right? But in the context of having a comeback and comebacks by the way i also feel like comebacks are part of life fall down come back up that's the human experience the human experience is not oh i've had a charmed life nothing ever went wrong i never learned any lessons if that were the case and uh, you know and if i don't learn from what i go through what good am i to anybody else what can i teach anybody else and you have that ability to tweak somebody's plan just enough to get them over the edge where they're trying to go. But tell us a little bit about what drives your personal brand and how you got to where you are, the roller coaster that you, the short roller coaster story. Sure. So, you know, success is either incidental or accidental, but not without failure, right? There's always this story that plays out in a way that we didn't anticipate. It's not like we said, well, I'm going to be rich by this age, broke by this age, rich again. We just sort of move forward. And I think resilience is an interesting word because resilience is the ability to get back up. Persistence is, you know, you just keep on banging your head against the wall. And there's there's a place for that, right? You know, harsh, there's a place for anything. But resilience is, you know, you get hit and you come back up. It's that, I think, Rocky 55 or something where he's talking to his son and he's like, it's not getting hit, it's getting hit and coming back up that makes great men or great women great. And all of us, you, me, everybody on the podcast has had those stories, either in a minuscule or rather, you know, grandiose fashion, not by design, but by happenstance. It just is inevitable. So now I was, you know, I was born in Caracas, Venezuela, came to the U.S. by not my choice, but thank God I did. Grew up in a nice, you know, little middle class neighborhood, was voted least likely to succeed in high school, dropped out of law school, didn't want to be a dick. 
wanted to, you know, become an entrepreneur because I wanted to be rich and I wanted to have freedom and worked for a company. They fired me, even though I became the number one guy, started my company, grew it, built it against all odds. They said we would never make it. We were Inc. 500 fastest growing company four times. Our sales guys, you know, outsold the competition five to one. Great success story. And then I just was absolutely positively miserable. And so I what, went. What kind of work? Yes. Sorry, sorry to interrupt you. What kind of company no, ahead, was what, what kind of company was that? We sold computer supplies to businesses and more consumables. Basically, you know, at the beginning it was ribbons for those big printers, you know, eh, 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 that print out the multi-part form papers. And then it as the technology evolved, became ink and toner and you know, I still don't know how the things work, but I've sold hundreds of millions of dollars worth of it. And, you know, it's like toilet paper, right? People didn't give a shit. Like, can I curse on your podcast? Yes. Yes, you may. Okay, good. People, okay, thank you very much. People didn't give a shit unless either breaks in their hand or they need something and don't have any, right? So toner and toilet paper are exactly the same. But we were differentiating ourselves, our brand. And we talk about that because it's really a very unique and interesting and pretty rather remarkable story because... We realized in the beginning, it was never about the product. As long as the product worked, it didn't matter. And it wasn't their money they were spending, it's their company's money. What they really wanted was an experience. And most people want experience in the absence of something going wrong. And then we realized, and we can talk about this if you want, is that you know most really uber successful companies have a saga. You know, and it, it comes back to remember Mel Gibson's Brave Heart. He's standing at the top and he goes, Freedom! And he <laughs> yeah. runs down, right? And that's the saga. And if you look at companies that are successful that you like, for example, Apple, think different. Apple's 1983 commercial with the Anvil and going to get, you know, Big Brother, IBM, and their moniker was Think. Apple's like, no, screw that. Think different, right? Amazon, the everything store, A to Z, it's what's called Amazon. Walmart, everyday low prices. We can talk about companies, you know, le left and right about what their saga is. And that's important because it inspires people. Yeah. So we understood we needed a saga. And our saga was that our industry was full of just a bunch of derelicts. So we wanted to beat the scammers. And that's what inspired our salespeople. And then we thought, okay, cool. That's the saga. But so what's the strategy? And where is this played out? And how do we win? And we realized that we had to win in literally the desk of our buyers. And we had to take over that as you would occupying territory. So we would create all these tchotchkes and things we could send they'd have on their desk. When a competitor called, they saw our name all over their desk. Little things like that. And then I created this M&M thing. Every time they bought from us, they got a big four pound bag of M&Ms. It was like a freaking small child, right? <laughs> so they get the Turner crutches in, they'd open up and they get the M&Ms. And we sent them a glass container with our name on it. And here's what was really cool, Hirsch is they'd get a new bag and they'd pour it on. And click, 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 click. You hear the sound of the M&Ms pouring into, the, into the, the, the jar. And what happened was all of their coworkers got the Plodovian response, who M&Ms, and they'd all get up and go visit this person whose job, among other things, was to buy a toner cartridge, which is a crappy-ass job. So we elevated their importance by getting them to be the center of attention by getting them. And I mean, we can go on and on and on about what we did. And then in order to us to get the client to buy from us, we had to ensure that our salespeople were significantly more persuasive than everybody else. And that created language patterns and scripting and all kinds of really cool stuff. But all that, you know, being said, we became super successful. I mean, I was, you know, making gobbles and gobbles of money. It was like printing money. But then I was still miserable, right? I was really, well, really not unhappy. literally, I, not literally printing money. As much as you were doing toner cartridges, we don't want to imply that you were printing no. your own money. But go although, ahead. although you know, if you could, right, it, it wouldn't be a bad. Thing. No, I'm kidding. It's, no, totally, it would no, be great. But printing yeah. money, meaning, yeah, yeah. So, but I remember I was, I had this Mercedes Benz CLS 55 AMG, custom made. You know, one of the new ones. It was like a, like a Batmobile rocket ship. I mean, that thing was just insane. And I was leaving my top of the hill, gorgeous house with celebrity neighbors, you know, headed down. We lived in the valley in the Calabasas area, headed down to my office, this big, beautiful second story floor. You know, and mind you, we sell freaking toilet paper, right? I mean, <laughs> this is not an attorney or an accountant or a private equity firm, right? But it looks like, you know, it looks like we're, we're financial advisors. I mean, these guys and beautiful people and and remember driving down, I got the beautiful wife, the three kids, money in the bank, you know, Hispanic, the American story. 
And I had this epiphany where I was like, I am fucking miserable. I hated the job and I hated the way things were. And right. I remember going, to, where's my ticker tape parade? I made it. I made the American dream. I got the wife, the three kids, everything, you know, the money. Where's my yay? And that was the, unfortunately the beginning of my own self-destruction. Mm. And because so was this empty, kind of an empty feeling that was supposed to be filled by something, right? Something outside of yourself. But you couldn't. You yeah. Know. At the time, I didn't know I was doing the dumbass thing, right? Hirsch, I had no idea I was beginning to sabotage myself. In retrospect, you know, you kind of, after you go through that, well, it was almost like coming out of a car crash. You're sort of dazed and confused, and you go from rich to poor to IRS to bankrupt. I mean, you know, you just go, what the heck happened? And so, in retrospect, you have time to reflect and engage in the previous components. But at the time, I didn't know what was happening. I just started making really poor choices. And I remember later realizing, you know, you're only one, two or three moves away from greatness or disaster. It's not 50 moves. It's only one, two or three from either greatness or disaster, right? Those moves that you make, those decisions. And sure enough, man, I mean, I, I was at $300,000 a month in net income, right? So 3.6, almost 4 million a year. And then I had a swing from 300 to negative 250. That's a $600,000 plus or 550 swing almost instantaneously. And then my ego kept me from making decisions to save the company. So 10 million that I had in the bank, just, I mean, it went quick, right? Less than 12 months, we were pretty much SOL. And then everything, employees left, stole accounts, which is highly unethical and, you know, get me really angry and, you know, everything. I lost everything, almost lost the house, the wife and the kids, you know, but plane gone, condo and mammoth gone, you know, money gone. And that was sort of this, that was about a two-year process whereby, you know, if you ever want to reevaluate the core of your being, go through that experience because it, it makes you think, especially if you want to hang on to things that are valuable, which in this case, wife and kids, you know, and, and what have you. And then, you know, for two years, I pretty much had my head on my ass, rocked myself to sleep, you know, rocked in a corner, stuck my thumb and, and wondered, what the hell happened? You know, because I wasn't aware of it at the time. And I turned into an asshole. I mean, I'm already an asshole. I was just more of an asshole back then <laughs> when this happened. Yeah. And I remember being in the library, kind of like the one here in California. We had this beautiful house. It was just gorgeous. And I'm working, right? I'm trying to rebuild everything. And I'm working all the hours that God sent, right? Up early, eight, you know, seven days a week. I'm not present with the kids. I'm, and I'm 10 times more miserable. But, you know, now I'm just pure willpower, right? Like just hanging on. And my beautiful wife comes in and I'm kind of doing some journaling. I've been keeping journals now since I was 21. I'm on journal number 39. And she says, you know, honey, if what you're doing isn't working, why don't you just do the opposite? <laughs> and it actually hit me pretty hard. And then she kind of walked out, like, you know, she just sort of mic dropped and moved on. And I was like, hmm. And I took it literally. You know, she says she meant it literally, right? She wants to take credit for it. I'll give her all the credit in the world. So I drew a little pyramid of my life. You know, what, what was I really focusing on? And, and, and turns out I was focusing on the things that are least important to me and neglecting things that are most important to me, meaning money. I needed to get money. And then my most important thing, which is my kids and my wife and health, were at the bottom of that in terms of time. And I said, where am I really spending my time, right? And, you know, my kids are young. They don't know what's going on. They don't know dad's broke, right? And they're just, you know, they still live in a big, beautiful house and there's no more slash maids. But, you know, they got a pool and dogs and we yeah, have yeah. a good time. They're being kids, as they should be. And so I thought, man, I got I to figure something out. So I looked at all my journals and started going, hey, I'm going to take out every principle, rule, and formula I ever had, and I'm going to put in a piece of paper in my journal, and I'm going to see if I can get asymmetrical results. Meaning, if I apply this, will I get a quantum leap, a greater return on my investment of time? And if I does get 5x or more, I'm going to throw it away. And I reached out to, you know, Richard Kosh, who's a friend of mine. So I've sort of been studying and reached out to him and reached out to a guy named Peter Daniels, who's still alive in Australia, you know, very wealthy guy. And so I had two or three guys and Cam Frazier is unfortunately deceased. And I said, you know, help me this one, you know, let, let me kind of help myself a little bit. And that was the beginning of, of a transformation whereby in three and a half years, we became twice as wealthy than we'd ever been before. I never went back to the office. In fact, we moved from California to Texas. And built this incredible machine that was very economical, but 
very wealth producing, get out of debt. I have no debt anywhere in the world. You know, we own properties and other businesses, no debt anywhere. Never went to the office, like I said, and ended up having the greatest marriage and the greatest father. And my three kids are incredible, 26, 23, 21. And it changed everything for me. And I I realized that I was doing everything backwards. You know, there are these two trajectories of life. There's fluid intelligence, crystallized intelligence. And the fluid intelligence is sort of the young, you know, uh, effervescent, ideological, innovative thinking, right? Those are the guys in what used to be Silicon Valley, but now that's dead. And they're the idea generators. That lasts about 10, 20 years, give or take, depending on the industry. Crystallized intelligence is for the, the wise individuals who are not as innovative and creative, but have wisdom. And that is really significantly more powerful than the innovation if you can marry the two. So I realized I was no longer in this sort of, you know, fluid intelligence, but crystallized intelligence. I've been at this for 20 plus years. I've broken every record, build the biggest company. But it's like, well, how do I utilize what I now know and change gears? Because what I was doing in the beginning wasn't working because I didn't want to do that anymore, right? So you have this mm-hmm. mental sabotage. And then I started, okay, well, you know, how do I create something different? And then along the process, one guy who knew me said, gee, I thought you were done and now you're doing well. Will you coach me? And I was like, buddy, you know, I'm just kind of hanging on my own thing right now, kind of building my stuff back. He goes, no, no, I'll pay 10,000 bucks a month. I said, no, nah, and he convinced me. And we don't just we're 13 years old. And I said, all right, let's do it. And for 12 months, he paid me 10 grand and absolutely nothing happened. Not a damn thing. <laughs> and I was like, buddy, I love the money. I don't need it. I'll take it. You know, it's, it's nice. It's good restaurant money. But, you know, I, I'm not helping you. And I gave him everything, right? Every I looked at my journal. Let's go to this and this. And the role of the CEO, saga, symbols, rituals, magic, code of conduct, all these really cool things to build companies, right? Right. And, nothing dude nothing was working so having a conversation one time i'm sitting outside right we had this beautiful hammock and this pavilion outside in the california home overlooking the valley beautiful view it was a great house and i'm just kind of chilling on the phone talking to him and, and i said hey you know what why don't we run you through a process that i ran myself through when i you know was in dire straits after my wife had the conversation we call it v2gp2 vision valley goals principle and price and what's your vision? Okay, he describes it. What's your values? Okay, you know, what principles are you going to use? Okay, you know. And then, you know, what's the price you have to pay? And when we got to the price, there was just silence. Mm. Just pure, deafening, painful silence on his part. Probably a good two minutes. And I'm just sitting there. <laughs> you know, as, a, as a sales guy, you know, when you ask for the order, you shut up. You don't say anything, right? Yes. Yeah. So I'm just in speak. silence. Yeah. yeah. And so I'm just waiting. And he finally goes, shit, Marks, I don't think I want to pay the price. And I had another light bulb. I was like, oh, dude, I got it. I totally got it. What had transpired or transformed me from Mr. Something to Mr. Nobody to let's fix this was a change in my belief system, a change in my mindset. And I describe mindset as as sort of what, what you hold to be true about yourself, others, and the world around you, right? And so, you know, just an easy definition. And he had this, he held true these things about himself, those around him in the world that prevented him. Because there's two things that if you ever want to double income, double time off, there's two enemies we have to combat instantaneously. The void and the mental thermostat, right? Those are the two biggest, scariest fucking things. Any entrepreneur, anybody who wants to double income, double time off has to face void and mental thermostat. And so I thought, oh man, I got it. I understand it. The role of the CEO is, was taught to me by a guy who worked for Lee Iacocca, Dan Wurtenberg, chief strategy, chief team building, chief sales, right? That's your branding. That's how you create the brand, right? You have strategy, team building, sales, and you promote this brand. But he's missing a piece, which is not really necessarily evident in the big world of corporate. Because if you're, if you're there already working for you know Ford or whatever, Apple, you know, Amazon, you have this mindset. But really is mindset, strategy, team building, and sales. So we want to work on the mindset of him and his entity. And as we just changed that, nothing else, just that, then he began to, as you would probably guess, otherwise I wouldn't tell the story, <laughs> everything began to become wonderful and fruition. He you know, tripled his income in six months and worked less. You know, it wasn't everything perfect, but we began to see some traction move along. And so, you know, I did not necessarily want to be what I've turned into because we sold the company a few years ago. But it was then, you know, I lived in California, right? The celebrity and high net worth individual rallies. I mean, you you lived in California. You know what it's like. Yeah. And if you're in that echelon world, 
when you're hanging out with these celebrities and hanging out with these big, big money guys, it's a, it's a, it's not what people think it is. It is a weird, interesting, you know, secret club, right? I mean, I don't want to, you know, curse too much, but it's a fucked up world in there. Yeah. And so my name began to circle within that world of, Hey, there's this guy over here. And then people would call me for the greatest thing. Hey man, I heard you this was so-and-so, you know, can you help me with this? And it had nothing to do with doubling income, doubling time off. It had to do with some kind of form of therapy, as you would, right? Or yeah, change, because yeah. they knew that the beliefs change, right? And so I said, yeah, you know, let me give it a go, see what happens, right? Because, you know, if I fuck up, it's you're the one that gets harmed, not me. So why not? Let's give it a go. <laughs> and yeah. we started to get really great results, right? And we then realized that in order for anybody to double their income, double their time off, all these other pieces are wonderful and they're necessary, but nothing happens if you press that focal point. That little, that little area that releases the anchor from their boat so they can move forward. And people don't sometimes think about that, right? They focus on other aspects. But if they're still stuck to something that isn't letting them move forward, that's their mental thermostat, if you would, right? And so we had a celebrity, I can't tell you who, who actor and musician, right? And they were sort of stuck at this. And they were, they were making good money, but they were sort of stuck at this component. And when we got rid of one aspect of, of what their life was like, the other aspect just skyrocketed. I mean, just skyrocketed. This is, you know, 10, maybe eight years ago, skyrocketed. And, it, and they wanted to do both, but and some people can, but this individual couldn't. And the anchor was this piece because he had this wrong idea of what was true for them uh-huh, and the world uh-huh. that around them. As we change that, then, you know, this, this sort of cathartic, you know, which uh, it's, Pretty powerful. So anyway, so then we started making money back in our business, and you know, we realized that money looks better when it's invisible, not when it's opulent, right? And so we just kept a really low profile, and then you know my brand, right, really was and still is among the elite high net worth and or celebrities. And we don't take on every call. We have a hundred percent success rate. We don't take on every client because I'm not stupid. If I can't succeed, I not you know what I mean. Like if I'm not going to take on the client, right? Because then it doesn't service right, one right. of us. And that's the story in a nutshell. Well, it's a great story. I could have interrupted you. you at any point and asked you to pause for a minute. But the way I look at it is like, I want to hear the story. I want to hear the flow. I want to hear the whole thing. You know, I'm a writer, right? So I see, I think in terms of the story, if the story is good, I don't want to fuck with it because I don't want to like <laughs> pull you out of where you were going. And right. then now we can dissect it a little bit. Now we can go back to one thing, which was the business that you did when you rebuilt was not this consulting, right? It was- No, so it was the same business of doing computer supplies, ink and toner to businesses. We just changed the model. Whereas before the right. model was copied from my previous employer and his previous employer, you know, sort of copy paste, which was designed on you get the more salespeople you get, the more accounts you can have, right? And then you sort of manage right. this machine. And, you know, and, and I think this is our machine, right? They have these four components mindset, strategy, team building, sales, the output of this manufacturing facilities, the EBITDA, and raw materials of time, ideas, money, people, resources, right? So you shove that in the machine, these four components create the product, how comes the EBITDA? If the EBITDA is low, something's wrong with the machine or the resources, you know, the, the natural materials, or if it's good, you know, these things are working well. And you always have to tinker with the machine and with the resources, right? Good right. ideas, bigger EBITDA, bad idea. Okay. So I thought, okay, well, if that's true. Then, you know, I don't need to create the model the same way I did. I have to change the paradigm. And then I thought to myself, well, you know, I had a lifestyle business, right? Because it wasn't duplicatable and, and, and nobody would buy it without me. And you know, that was not going to work. How do I create an even greater lifestyle business? And then that poses a question, well, what then what is the lifestyle you want? Like, what do you really want? And most people don't know what they want, right? They just sort of wake up every day and, you know, and, and go about this routine and this sort of hypnotic conditioning. So it made me really think, well, what do I really want? And then I gave myself the ability to change my want purposefully. Because if not, then it would become a static rather than a dynamic living entity. Yeah. And so I thought, I want this now, but I'm going to reevaluate on a continual basis. So the more I reevaluated, the more it morphed into a lifestyle I wanted, which then allowed me to make more money, by the way. And it was not about working harder, because if that was true, ditch diggers would be wealthy. It was about finding this little, you know, what are the little things I can do to create the greatest amount of return for my time, energy, and focus, sort of the 80-20 principle. And it was, and I asked it, you know, most people think, 
unfortunately, you know, Tim Ferriss, God love his soul, in yeah. his book, gave the impression that the 80-20 principle is about eliminating, right? You know, the to do not right, right. And, 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 and all that shit. But you know, what happens is, is that if you live your life that way, you're going to be depressed and anxiety ridden because you're going to focus on getting rid of stuff. Mm-hmm. That's not how the 80 principle is really applied. 80 principle is a diagnostic tool to say, this stuff isn't working. This stuff really is. And then you go, okay, great. I'm going to lean on the 20% grow that, maximize that, and that will naturally, organically, and happily push out the 80%, which will then be repurposed into another area where that 8% might be a 20%. So it's not about, you know, people eliminate. I Listen, I've talked to, as you have, tons and tons of people, right? And I get these, what I call fake happy people. Oh, my life is great. I have an assistant and this <laughs> and that. And they, yeah. they tell me how great their life is and they don't do anything. And you look into their eyes and there's a depression that's just sitting there, right? There's anxiety, depression, unhappiness. They're just, they're fucked, right? Because yeah. the void, and it's just, it's attacking them. And yet, when you look at people who are doing things they really enjoy, and sometimes that means working, you know, quote unquote, working or being active throughout the day, are super happy. But they love what they're doing, you know, like, Jim Rohn, God rest his soul, one of the greatest adventures I ever had, one time has this line where he says to a bunch of psychiatrists, he says, you know, let me tell you what I think most messes with the mind. And they said, oh, pray tell, Jim Rohn, non-psychiatrist, <laughs> non-pedigree guy, what do you think most messes with the mind? And he drops a beautiful piece of wisdom. He says, doing less than you possibly can. And that's true. But true. This is why you find a lot of people don't want to do mental work because they'd rather go do physical work because they get a sense of accomplishment rather yeah. than yeah. understanding. Okay. So I, I was very aware of that. And that was part of my problem in the beginning. And so I thought, okay, well, how do I grow my business? So I have as little input as I possibly can while I make bazillions of dollars, but only in so much as I can then parlay the time and money into something that I really could do 24-7 whatever that is, right? Not what I think I should be doing, but what I really love to do. And that, you know, Peter Drucker used to have, management consulting guy, used to take a new skill every three to five years, pottery, French, it didn't matter what the skill was. He wanted something else to do. So I thought, okay, well, I need to give myself dynamic because I didn't want to do this for six months, you know, and then the next six months, not. So that's what drove me was, you know, how do I beat the system, right? Most entrepreneurs want to do that. Beat the system so I can live the life I want and make a ton of money. And the money serves my purpose of living the life I want versus chasing the dollar. Because people who chase the dollar become unhappy and they become poor. That's what happened yeah. to me. Rather than chasing something and then the dollar becomes an indication of how well you're succeeding at that one thing. Well, I think, Marx, to add to that, what I'm finding from talking to so many people and granted, a lot, and I have another podcast called Truth Tastes Funny that is about surviving in a crazy world. So those stories are stories of survival, but they have nothing to do with business. So I get the truth, I feel, from both sides. I get the truth of people who have inspiring stories of success, failure, success, whatever it might be, and then people who have inspiring stories of survival. And what I've come to understand is that I think a lot of us have it all backwards, We think, and even though we're told, sometimes we're told, do what you love, but it's not make a living doing what you love. It's do what you love as your first priority and fill in the rest of the space with the things that you need to sustain that, the money, whatever you want. You can fill it in. You ever pack a suitcase and you have room for the, you worry about the socks and the underwear last because you could just shove it anywhere. Same thing with with business, yeah. I think. And and if you're doing what you love and the business as it has for you springs finally from the experience that you've had and what you're really doing and what a lot of a lot of advisors and coaches and consultants and even, even where I'm where my head ended up without even thinking about it is coaching people on what you've learned. And what you did, what you've made mistakes and the things that you've done right and the things, it's just, it's the most pure form of sharing knowledge that any of us can engage in, you know? There there is, agreed, there is a power, and I'm using that word deliberately, 
that comes from having a certain kind of attitude when you're engaging in business or other aspects of life. And, you know, you can call it whatever you want. You can call it, you know, screw it, who cares? But it's exemplified in the Arnold Schwarzenegger story on Netflix. Have you seen that yet? No, I didn't see that yet. I highly recommend it. You know, oh, Bill yeah. Burr does a pretty a funny skit on one of them. So, you know, Arnold, we all know Arnold's story. Right? He succeeded in four different things. Bodybuilding, number one, right? He had, he had right. this vision. Now, he's not a perfect human being, so I'm not putting him up as a role model of what you should be like. I'm just exemplifying what it's yeah. like to have a fuck you attitude. I don't really care. So he does bodybuilding, succeeds at it. Then he wants to go into acting like Reg Park. But no one's hiring this, oh, good, good. you know, he's like, he's, he's, he's not that bright, right? Or it doesn't sound like he's actually very smart. So the, he then says, I'm going to go make money in real estate. And Joe Weider taught him. So he starts making money in real estate. So he's a millionaire in Santa Monica, California, before he goes to acting. Right. So he shows up as this already, you know, ultimate bodybuilding champion who's already rich and has these meetings with these casting directors and producers. And he just has this attitude of, I just don't give a fuck. Right. Versus, right, the other desire of behind me, behind me, behind me. And that elevates him. It, because it, it, people, he becomes Teflon, right? People yeah. admire that confidence because it's it's himself, right? You know, to that own self be truth. Therefore, shall not be false to any man or whatever it was that Shakespeare said. He becomes to himself true. And this happened in politics, right? When he got accused of groping women, I am sorry, I was not meant to group it. People are like, okay, who cares? Boom, let's keep going. And so he has this ability. And that really is the state that we want to live in because when we're in that state, our true desires, whatever they may be, or would come out. And then that drives us to live our life our own way. Now, I happen to believe, personally, that everybody needs money to fill their desires, right? I mean, it does, now the amount of money may be different, but we all need money. Mm -hmm. So we have to find a way to increase our income and our not active but passive income, if you can, so we can do those things. But if you don't have purpose-driven you know, ambition, you'll never make a lot of money. You just won't. Now, and that changes. My very first ambition of making money was I wanted to be rich. I had linked being rich to getting my mom's love, right? Because she said my dad was a deadbeat. He wasn't. And that, you know, he doesn't love you because he doesn't spend enough money. So I thought, well, the way I get my mom's love, which she didn't give me, was to make money. So I that's what drove uh, my desire okay. to make money, okay, yeah. right? But then once I got the money, and I was okay, well, I still don't feel fulfilled per se, right? What do I want? And so when I do consulting, coaching, whatever you want to call it, you know, we simplify, maximize, clarify, and leverage, right? And, but in simplification, you got a clarity. Who are you? What do you want? And where are you? And you talked about truth. You know, Winston Churchill said, the truth is incontrovertible. Malice may attack it. Ignorance may deride it. But in the end, there it is. The hillbilly way of saying it is you might as well start with the truth because you're going to end up with it, right? It just, it's going to be there <laughs> no matter what happens. Yeah. And so we have to kind of strip away of what, what do you really want? And sometimes... It's buried so deep inside because of so much shit that's been piled up by people outside of us that it takes a minute to get. You know, we feel guilty or undeserving or judged or whatever. Now, I'm not saying that, you know, if you're married and you want to go have sex with a bunch of other people, that's okay desire. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the stupid stuff. I'm talking about, you know, what really drives you, what brings you to the highest level of your potential. And when you find out what that is, everything else flows much easier. And then actually, believe it or not, making money is significantly easier because you'll have the same attitude that Schwarzenegger had when you make income decisions. You just won't be persuaded to make stupid choices because you'll have the strength of character as to what you want, right? right? And so when you meet people like that, you know, I don't want to get into politics because I'm sure that, you know, your audience leans one way or the other multiple times. So I don't want to offend anybody, but you can find people in your own world who you may or may not like, but who are truly themselves. And that gives them power, not power over you. It gives them power of clarity as to what they want and to hold steadfast to that. And that's what I was lacking when I went bankrupt and went belly up is I was unhappy, not with my dumbass employees. And I was unhappy with myself because yeah. I wasn't living what I really wanted. You know, and, and I didn't want to be wearing you know, a suit and it just wasn't my thing, right? Well, that marks, that circles back beautifully to where we started, which was that you had achieved all the success, couldn't figure out what was missing, 
And so you dissembled it basically, you know, you took it apart subconsciously and then woke up and it yep. was taken apart and you were like, what the fuck happened? What happened? But that was that learning experience that we were talking about in the beginning. That was, I think that the thing that makes me comfortable getting older is that I feel like, okay, well, whether I set out to learn a lot or not, I've become more wise and and more knowledgeable. And so I have more to offer, which, you know, takes us to that, you know, what happened to respecting our elders. And as people get older and wiser, you know, sometimes we just think of them as a burden or whatever it is. I think in society, we're a little smarter now, some of us, but maybe not. But one of the things that somebody said to me yesterday, I said, what can we do? You know, as we were talking about climate, we were talking about, you know, the state of affairs in the world. It was one of those conversations. And it was on my other show. And I said, well, what can we do? Like, if certain things are out of our power, what can we do? And she said, improve your skill set as a human being. Become more skilled as a human being. And that will make you essential to whatever turns the world takes. And I thought, wow, that's awesome. Become an essential human being. So, you know, that was my takeaway. I just wanted to share that with you because I thought you'd appreciate it. Oh, I think it's great. Look, in, in the 1930s, when the Great Depression happened and FDR put in place Social Security and there were bread lines and stuff, people would rather work for 50 cents a day at the Empire State Building with the risk of dying than standing in line for a piece of bread. They wanted to be valued and to contribute. Right Now it's the opposite, right? Now it's what can I get away with and not do? Oh, the government's going to send me a check? Good. Let me win the good, right? And, and you can say you're being smart, but it's the dumbest thing you can do because you're eroding your self-esteem, your self-image, right? The greatest value we can generate for ourselves is who we become, not what we get. That's a paraphrase from Jim Rohn. And so the mindset of the U.S. is no longer what it used to be, which made us the U.S. It is now morphing. Much like I went into bankruptcy and fucked it all up, that's what has to happen, unfortunately, for the United States as an overall population, which is unfortunate, but every society has gone through, right? There's always this, you know, elation and crash and then re-emergence and what have you. I, look, the greatest thing on the planet is to put your bed in the pillow and fall asleep and know you did a good job that day. Because you were true to yourself and you gave it your best, right? It doesn't matter what it is. It really doesn't matter what it is. Now, I personally believe that if you're going to be on this planet, you might as well make a shitload of money and do the things you want to do, right? Like we travel a lot. I love to travel. Love to travel. Yeah. I've been to places that I'm like, wow, man, this is amazing. Been to places where I'm like, ooh, what the hell is that? But it's not that difficult to do. Changing your mindset is not that hard. Changing how you view the world it changes, then what you do, which then changes results. We have something called the BBR formula. R means results at the bottom, right? So you have three little circles and they're driven by a little stake in between them. Everybody wants results. You want to lose weight, it's a result. You want to gain weight, results. You want money, results, happiness. It's all results. What drives results is, of course, behavior. And what drives behavior is, of course, so if you change the belief, you automatically change the behavior and then you change the result. Remember, I was white knuckling, trying to get my success back, and it was about willpower, this, and but nothing was happening because my beliefs were not the proper beliefs. Once I changed those beliefs, behavior became no different than brushing your teeth or you know wiping your butt. It just kind of was something you do, and then the results became significantly greater. And the better I worked on changing my beliefs, it affected my behavior naturally without willpower, without discipline. Even though it looks like I have discipline, and then results change. People focus on content and process, which are these total bubbles between belief, sorry, between behavior and result. And they think if I change the content and the process, I'll get a different result. No, yeah. they're important, but that's not it. You know, you've heard the analogy of, you know, if someone took one of your loved ones and held the gun to the head and said, you got to make a million dollars in 30 days, we do do it. Of course I do it. Then why the fuck right. are you doing it now? Because it's not true, right? But you would do it. So the question becomes, how do we then define where we are currently, truthfully? Not, you know, bullshit, right? You know, what are the good, bad, and ugly? And then what do we really want? And is that truly what we want? Is that really what we really want to do? And then, okay, what's the gap? And then how do we joyfully with style and elegance and happiness close the gap so they match? I don't believe in, you know, we got to pay the price. You got to grow. Right. That's right. silly. That's just, that's silly. Because, you well, know, why suffer? 
Yeah, you learn. You, I mean, you'll learn something. You'll hopefully take something away from it. But it wasn't the the starving artist thing, or the suffer for your art, or suffer for, or just work your ass off. You know, down to the bone. It's none of those things are true. I think that personally, I think in the end, you're the only arbiter of whether you're a success or not. No one else can tell you. Even people you That's love, correct? Not that them. Correct. You know. That is, but I, the, I, the thing is, you you know, no, my experience. People, you know, people are successful. You could just see it in them. You could be like, yep, yeah, he's successful or he's not, or she is, or she's not, you know, and it has nothing to do with money. You just feel it. You just sense it yeah. in them. Right. And look, I, I'm not saying that, you know, I love doing martial arts, jujitsu and kickboxing, whatever have you. Well, at least I used to love as much of it. And most of the time when I was doing, I'll get my ass kicked, <laughs> but I loved every minute of it. I'm struggling. I'm grunting. Some guys get on top of me, mounted position, like in the UFC when the guy's in the bottom and they're just pounding on me. And now I'm getting my ass beat and I'm not enjoying the moment, but I'm loving the process because of the learning. And then I get to go back and get better. And there's progress. Progress is very motivating. So it's not about how great are you. It's are you making progress along the line? So when I talk about, you know, doing it joyfully, happily, and easily and with less effort, doesn't mean there's no struggle. It's just a happy struggle. You know, I think Ray Dalio coined the term, you have to learn to struggle well, right? Mm -hmm. And I, I don't know what he yeah. means by it, but I take it as, you know, you can cross a river full of leeches and piranhas if you have to get to the side. You can cry, you can not cross, you know, you can cross and be stoic, you know, or you can cross and be miserable, or you can cross and laugh your ass off or you're getting bit and sucked on, right? <laughs> no pun intended. And, you know, that didn't sound right, but you get my point, right? Yeah. <laughs> and so, you know, it, Mike Tyson said, discipline is like, you know, doing the thing you hate to do as if you loved to do it. Mm, and yeah. so different to an all, but, but you get my point. So when I started rebuilding my business and, and changing myself, I began to happily do it. I began to love the struggle. I began to love the fact that, I mean, I would, I would sit in my office by myself and laugh my ass. Like, how did I fuck this up so royally? Like, how stupid was I to make those decisions, right? Sometimes I cried, but sometimes I laughed. And that was the beginning after two years. And it went, I mean, it just started moving. I couldn't make money faster because I just couldn't move the pieces quicker. But it began, to, you know, Napoleon Hill in this book, Thinking Grid, said, when riches come, they come a little to no effort and they, they come in such a high abundance, you wonder where have they been. Very true. It's what happened to me. Yeah. Nothing to do with the work I did, all to do with the change in mindset. If you've enjoyed this episode of Brand Voice Runway, please leave a five star review and subscribe to the podcast. The positive reinforcement keeps us going. Who am I kidding? Founders like us keep going regardless. Thanks so much for listening and make tomorrow greater than today.